want to live long They have no use for your song You're dead, you're dead, you're dead You're dead and out of this world I have been watching the Prime Minister for the past couple of days give indications of what the situation will be like on July the 19th, after July the 19th, so-called Freedom Day. And there's a couple of things that puzzle me about it. And this is where I'm hoping you can help me to inscrutinise and investigate this a little bit more. So Boris Johnson has told reporters, I'm very confident that the double jabs will be a liberator and they will enable people to travel. We'll be setting out a lot more about the detail of that in the course of July in the course of the next few days about how we see it working. But there's no doubt at all that once you've got two jabs, you're in a much better position. That's what the Prime Minister actually said. That's why it didn't make much sense. That that was a direct quote. The Express has reported that the government is expected to sign off a plan that will lift mandatory isolation for those who have received both jabs, even if they've come into contact with someone who has tested positive. And the Times newspaper said that on Monday, ministers will sign off plans plans which f- the fully vaccinated will be advised to undergo testing if they have such contact. So it will no longer be mandatory. So we've got three things happening here. We've got, first of all, that the regulations become advisory as opposed to mandatory. Second, that if you're double jabbed, you don't have to necessarily isolate if you've come into contact with someone with COVID. And thirdly, if you're double jabbed, the expectation is that you won't have to quarantine when you come back from holiday. And my questions to you are twofold. First of all, what do you think is the motivation behind this? Why is Boris Johnson going against the advice of his scientific advisors again and making these promises to the public? What do you think that's about? And my second question is, What are your fears about this, this type of messaging where there's one rule for the vaccinated, another rule for people who aren't vaccinated, where everything is being loosened despite warnings from experts? What do you think might happen? 0345 606 0973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Where we're joined now by Professor Martin McKee, who is a professor of European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Welcome to the program professor i i saw on andrew mars show last sunday he him say that he's double jabbed but still managed to contract covid he believes at the g7 conference and that's something that he described as, as being very unpleasant should people be concerned that they're not as immune as they might think they are after two vaccinations Well, we do need to remember that we now have the Delta variant circulating and we know that the vaccines that are in use are less effective. Uh, They're very effective vaccines. I mean, let's not get this wrong. And it's crucial that people are vaccinated and double vaccinated because they will give them a high level of protection, but it's still less than it would have been with the earlier variants. But what you've been saying, we need to, you really need to unpack it because there's an awful lot of issues wrapped up in all of that, but maybe you'll come on to that. Oh, but no, please do elaborate. Well, first of all, we're, here we are talking tonight on the basis of unattributed briefings to newspapers. Mm. So I really do hope that the Speaker of the House of Commons is going to ask the Prime Minister why these things are not being announced to the House, which is where they should be, and so that we could scrutinise them. And the second issue that puzzles me really is that up until now, the Prime Minister has been saying that it's about data, not dates. But these briefings are talking about dates, not data. Mm. So if we are going to be having a change, I'd like to know what the criteria are for doing it. Uh, Why are we moving away from the data, not dates? And the third issue, which I think is really problematic, is that I, I I study this all the time. I spend hours every day trying to understand more about this virus. I have no idea at all what the government is trying to achieve at the minute, because in the past it seemed to be about driving the virus down. But the virus, the rates are going up at the minute and the government seems unconcerned about this and hospitalizations are also going up. So to my mind, as an epidemiologist, they're either going up, in which case I'm worried, or they're going down, in which case I'm reassured. But if they're going up, I would like to see measures being taken that will bring them down because eventually they will continue to go up and get to a high level. Do you think it's perhaps that the government is too fixated on death rates and not considering things like severe symptoms, hospitalizations, and of course, long COVID, which is a bit of an unknown quantity at the moment? 
Well, I think the government has been very good at ignoring long COVID, um, and we don't have very much discussion about that at all. And that's particularly an issue for children who are affected by it. There is no discussion or very little uh, indication that we're prepared to do what most many other countries are now doing, which is to vaccinate children uh, who are at risk of this condition. So I think the long COVID is something we need to be talking about a great deal more. But I genuinely don't know what the government is fix- fixated on at the minute. I think that's the difficulty because the message are just extremely confusing and that's not good when we need trust in the middle of a pandemic. Now I've spoken to experts such as yourself on the programme previously and asked about what we know in terms of the vaccine giving protection against passing COVID along to others and the answer has always been that the evidence is unclear. Do we have a clearer picture now? Uh, we are getting a clearer picture that the uh, vaccine is very good at protecting against severe illness and hospitalisation, but there are certainly plenty of cases where it is being transmitted to other people. It's difficult to know because, of course, you you can't actually observe the act of transmission except in very rare circumstances. And uh, so we do know, for example, that with rates going up quite high in children at the minute, they're definitely involved in the transmission and we can discuss forever whether they are being infected from the community or they are infecting other members of the community. But clearly they're playing a key role in all of this. Um, but definitely there are cases, uh, quite a few cases, where people are have been vaccinated and, and they can pass it on to other people. So so that is a particular concern. I wanted to ask you about that, about children and young people. What do you think the potential impact is of restrictions being lifted in the summer when children are on holiday? And we know, as you say, that the virus is spreading like wildfire in that demographic. Yeah, I think it's particularly worrying because we're not vaccinating them the way many other countries are, as I mentioned. So uh, I, it's quite difficult to know because we do know that rates among children have fallen during the half term and during other holidays. So it is possible because they're not mixing together indoors in quite the same way that we may not see such a problem, but it may then come back with a vengeance in the, in the autumn. So just looking at what's happened at Easter holidays, half term and so on, I think we may see at least a, fl- a, a, a flattening But, of course, it does depend a lot on what they're doing. And finally, Sajid Javid, the new health secretary, has said we need to get out of restrictions as soon as possible and that they should be irreversible. And that's apparently contrary to what his predecessor, Matt Hancock, believed. And I wonder, I I know that you're not privy to the discussions that happen in Whitehall, but as far as you're you're concerned, has there been any new information which would explain that, that change in policy? Yes, we have a new Secretary of State. I think that's uh, what we've uh, seen. Uh, we, we all want us to get out of lockdown as soon as possible. Lockdowns are disastrous. I mean, we're absolutely the last thing that we want. But unfortunately, if you let the virus get out of control, then eventually you're going to have to have them. So that's why I think that I and many colleagues have been arguing for all of the other things that we should have been doing, which is looking at ventilation, for example. Uh, and we're moving into the summer months, then it is easier for people to, you know, to go for entertaining outdoors and so on. There's a lot that could be done. Um, And we obviously do need to get the vaccinations rolled out as quickly as possible. One of the worrying things we're hearing at the minute, of course, is that uh, even though vaccines are available and there's a risk that they may be going to waste, the government is now being very rigidly adhering to the the eight and 12 week uh, uh, delay before people get the second vaccine. I think we just need to do everything possible to get as many people getting the second vaccine dose as possible. And uh, but we also really do need to look at vaccinating younger people because the vaccine is approved for younger people. There have been millions of people, young people worldwide who have been vaccinated. It's extremely safe and it's a mystery why we're not doing it. Professor Martin McKee, Professor of European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine there. And you can hear the frustration in his voice, can't you, that once again, the Prime Minister is or certainly appears to be going against the advice of the scientists who are telling him what the best public policy would be to keep everyone safe. And it seems to me to be a PR move. I mean, Professor Martin McKee made a very, very important point 
point at the beginning of that interview that we're getting these as tidbits fed through the tabloid media. We're not hearing proper announcements being made in the House of Commons where they should be made. So everything's a little bit confusing at the moment. And we know that there are some people who are naturally cautious when it comes to COVID and that there are some people who will always you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. They will always take the mick. So would it not be better to have a prime minister who rather than being concerned with his own popularity and being able to put out these pretty sound bites, which make everybody feel momentarily better, was actually a little bit more cautious, a little bit more concerned with the science. I mean, how worried are you right now? That's my first question to you. And my second question is, what do you think are the motivations behind this 19th of July date, which is being rigidly stuck to, even though we were always told that it was about data, not dates. And if the data changed, then our road out of lockdown would have to change. Why do you think the Prime Minister is saying there will be one rule for those who are double jabbed and another rule for others? Do you think that this is going to cause confusion? And are you worried about the potential ramifications in terms of the health and the safety of the nation? You can call me on 0345 6060 973 if you have thoughts on any of those questions. I am, with your help, examining the sound bites that are coming from the Prime Minister. We've been promised that those who are double jabbed won't necessarily have to quarantine when we travel, that we won't have to isolate if we know that we've come into contact with someone with COVID. And this seems to run contrary to the scientific advice that the government is being given. So I'm asking you why? Why do you think he is doing this? Why all of this emphasis on Freedom Day, so-called Freedom Day? What's the benefit? What do you think he's trying to achieve? And if, like me, it makes you a little bit trepidatious, a little bit worried about the potential consequences and whether people are just going to go away and forget everything come 19th of July. Give me a call and tell me what you think might happen. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Cindy has texted on 84850 and said, Hi Natasha, I think it's about two issues. One, the NHS app pinging, causing individuals and families pressure and loss of income. And two, itchy and restless communities. Interesting. Well, Lanry has called from Barnet. What would you like to say? Yeah, uh, my issue is the government is, we cannot get a zero risk of COVID. What the government is doing rightly is to promote people to go out and get the, uh, and get the job. The scientists are waiting for us to get zero risk. We cannot. The vaccination is, as, is breaking the link between serious illness and hospitalization which is what the government is promoting. Yes, the, the level is rising, but it's not a, a, as high as it was because of vaccination. That's number one. Number two, and we, yes, there's a slight increase in hospitalization, but not as much, and not, uh, thankfully, thank to God, not as much death as well. So but la, but let me, uh, run, my question to you is this. Yes, I completely take your point that we can't wait for zero risk of COVID. But when it comes to things like quarantining when you come back from holiday, wearing a mask, social distancing, society can still function while these things are taking place. So why are they not keeping those restrictions in place to minimise the chance of infection? We, we know that if you are job, doubly job, you, you, you are over 96% protected from all the serious illness or... Yeah. But and not then, from yeah, long COVID, potentially, not, which, which yeah, is the not, real danger. Yeah, not from long COVID. I agree with you, but you can still... You don't need to quarantine when you, when you travel, but because you have, you've been doubly jabbed when you come back. That's, that's what I feel should happen because that's the benefit of being doubly jabbed. You can still continue to use your face mask and social distance, but we should actually have some freedom to go, ahead, to go about with our normal life. And what about new variants? Because most of those have originated in other countries, apart from the Kent variant, of course, and been brought into the country by people travelling back and forth. I mean, I think the point is, is that we don't necessarily know what the situation will be come the 19th of July. It's, it's in two weeks' time. So what if, if the situation has changed by then? Would you still advocate pushing ahead? 
Yes, I will still because you see, uh, virus will mutate. We will always have variants. That is why what I would, what I think will happen is that we are going to, we'll have to go into a, 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 a situation where we, we like flu jab, we get booster every year to give it to the vulnerable or everybody below certain, above certain age will get a booster dose. And I agree with what the scientists said, we should vaccinate the, the children as well, maybe from the age of 12 or 16 upwards. That is the way we can get it, uh, get a, a handle on it. And so, to, so I'm, I, I'm glad that you, you see the benefit of the, the vaccine, Lanry. And I wonder, therefore, because I hear some people saying that they're concerned about the fact that the world will open up for those who are double jabbed and for those who have either chosen or cannot have the vaccine, they won't have the same freedom. As, are, are you comfortable with that? I'm not comfortable with uh, 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 reducing the liberty of anybody. I'm not comfortable with that, but we we all still have to take some precaution. Mm. So I'm not comfortable with that, but I think if you are doubly jab, like any other virus, if you are doubly jab, if you have the immunity, you still have certain risks, but you have to c continue to get about with with your normal life. What we should do is to promote and have a way of getting as many people as possible to get jabbed. That is what is going that on the long run. That is what is going to get us out of the pandemic. Whatever we do, life has to continue. Lanry from Barnet, thank you for kick-starting this conversation. Really interesting. Al has called from Ealing. What would you like to say? Hi there, um, I'd like to say that actually your previous call was uh, spot on in many respects, is that we have two issues here. We have those a largely vaccinated nation cannot be held to ransom by not being able to plan ahead. If you think about one of the prospective measures is to continue this track and trace and self-isolation. Mm. I think that has to be a non-starter. It's a non-starter because if you think about it, you can make a plan to go to a wedding, to a funeral, to the pub or a family gathering, and then you're essentially at risk of not being able to do any of those things because you are caught by track and trace. Someone put it, I think, extremely well by, <clears throat> at the moment, we're a nation of healthy people trying to avoid other healthy people on the off chance that one of those healthy people will be test, tested positive for COVID. And I think that is simply an untenable issue. Um, the second issue, of course, is one of fairness, which you just brought up, mm. which whereby is it fair to allow people's double jab, for example, a greater degree of freedom from those who haven't been double jab? And I think that the answer to that, of course, is, is, is problematic, but I don't think in the end you can hold back what is essentially millions of people from living a, a more normal, or say, a normal life uh, as the rest of the, those people, the rest of the nation catches up. I don't think you can. So I think we can address the issue of fairness in, in that respect. Well, also, uh, something that occurred to me when I was listening to my colleague David Lamy's show earlier, and he was talking about the number of people who pretend to use the Track and Trace app and aren't really, and how it's so difficult to, to monitor that. How will we know who's had the jab and who hasn't? Well, I think, you, I think you're, you're absolutely dealing with human nature here, and I, I couldn't agree more, in the sense that if I have a, an event planned, for example, and I am, know that I'm at risk from being prevented to go to that because I might be caught by track and trace, I, two things. One, I, won't, I, will, I will do what I think many people do, which is wave their, their mobile phone at the, the track and trace um, uh, track and trace point without mm. it being switched on. Mm. Second of all, I won't have the NHS app. But third, m as importantly, is that if I'm told to isolate, I won't. If, if, as it was put this morning on the radio, I don't sadly I think it was your station, but you know, to one of the one of the various scientists who opine on these things, if we're getting forty, fifty thousand tests, um, positive tests daily, we're likely to get you know up to a million people pinged by track and trace. People simply will not obey it. There has to be a level of, 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 of fairness and people will not isolate. And um, Al, so I, I think what, what your call has made me realise is that I'm a little bit sceptical about this narrative, which has obviously gone alongside the announcements that we've heard from government about personal responsibility and individual responsibility, because, of course, some people cannot afford to isolate. And so what it feels to me that what the government is actually saying is, right, no more help from us now. The furlough scheme is ending. You do what you think is right. And if things go wrong in the future, we can then place the blame on you. It, it feels to me like passing the buck. 
Well, I don't mind. You know, I don't mind personal responsibility. I think one of the things we've seen over the past 15 months is, a, is an unprecedented restriction on, on, on our liberty. I don't want to become more, you know, too dramatic about it, but there has been unprecedented restrictions. And, and I would like to see a lot more nudge rather than a lot more than the legislation we've had. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we are responsible for ourselves. So if there is personal responsibility, then I think that's perhaps no bad thing. I think one of the other things we need to appreciate is that we, in, in what are we now, 3rd of July, we, you know, in a couple of weeks, the whole nation is going to have to change its psychology dramatically. Mm. Are we going to wake up on the 19th of July and discard our masks on a big bonfire and go and hug everyone we see? Well, I don't think we are, but at the same I time... I think some people will. Well, I, I might be. Um, but I think, you know, we are in a place collectively, psychologically, where we are scared. Mm. Now, whether that's by intentional design or by, by, by incidentally so, uh, we need somehow, as your, again, your previous call was exactly, exactly right, we need to not have these restrictions which, which slowly chip away at our psychological well-being. Well, I think, Al, it would be easier to feel confident and to not feel so frightened if we had a government that seemed to be listening properly to the scientists, that was clear on what the plan was, was sending out their announcements in, in a, the typical way, i.e. giving their... Um, presenting them at the, the House of Commons as opposed to drip feeding them through media. It's difficult when the people in charge, uh, their policies appear to be so utterly shambolic. It's difficult not to feel frightened because when Boris Johnson says, come July 19th, if you're double jabbed, it's safe for you to live as you did before the pandemic. I don't believe him. I don't believe him. So I will continue to be cautious and trepidatious and I will probably continue to wear my mask and social distance where possible. And I will never be free from that psychological prison, I guess, until we have a change in government and we have somebody who we can actually trust in in that position of power. Al, thank you for your call. I'll, I'll tell you what I think might be going on here. I, all day on LBC, my colleagues have been taking calls about th these two by-elections that the Tories have lost, firstly in Chesham and Amersham and then in, in Batley and Spen. And numerous political commentators have said this is not an indication that the Conservatives are losing nationally or... or uh, losing their popularity nationally, that Boris Johnson is as popular as he's ever been. And the reason for this is their response to COVID and specifically the vaccine rollout. Vaccines are the big success story the government have been clinging and cleaving to over the past year. So I think part of this is the Prime Minister has to give some kind of tangible benefit to people who have been vaccinated. He can't say, we're not sure, we don't know what's going on with the Delta variant, the data's not there yet, the scientists are advising us to be cautious because people will say, well, why did I bother getting the vaccine then? Your big success story, what does it amount to? I think that's at least part of the motivation behind what we're seeing. 03456 060973 is the number to call if you either agree or disagree with that or if you have some thoughts to add you can text 84850 or tweet at LBC. So effectively two questions on the announcements that we've heard from Boris Johnson which have been drip fed through the tabloid media. The first is why and the second is what will it mean? What do you think the world will look like after the 19th of July and are you excited by that prospect or like me are you a little bit scared? Discussing the fact that the Prime Minister has said that those who are double jabbed may not have to self-isolate or quarantine after the 19th of July and in doing so he's effectively created a two-tier society where those who have been double jabbed will be able to continue life pretty much as normal and those who haven't because they can't or because they won't won't be able to do that and I'm wondering what you think the motivation behind that announcement is because it's not enforceable in any meaningful way we have no way of checking whether people have been jabbed or not and even if we could check we don't have the resources to be able to enforce it on the ground and I've shared with you what I think might be going on and, and it's that vaccines are the big success story 
of the past year. And you only have to watch Johnson's performance at PMQs to see proof of that. No matter what Keir Starmer asks, Boris Johnson will find a way to shoehorn vaccines into the answer, culminating in that awful incident a few weeks ago, of course, when the Prime Minister responded, we jab, they jabber, in response to a question from the leader of the opposition about rape survivors. So the Prime Minister has to give some kind of tangible benefit to people who have been vaccinated. He has to make it seem as though Britain is ahead of the pack on COVID, despite the fact that we now have more infections than the rest of the European Union combined. He has to try and make it feel like we're winning. And I think that once again, the Prime Minister is putting his approval rating ahead of the advice he's getting from scientists, because his political ambitions are more important to him than your health and your life. What do you think? Am I on to something? 03456060973 is the number to call. You can also text on 84850. John Embarking has done that and said, firstly, I think the point you made to the scientist was right. The government is only concerned about death rates and are dismissing long COVID. Secondly, the only thing in this government's locker is the vaccine and this will solve everything. Solve is in inverted commas. Lastly, continuing to wear masks, social distance, etc., is a collective reminder of the desire disaster that was our government's response, an island nation with 150,000 deaths and all the other failings. It's 128,000, but I, I take your point. Our government moves from being the overseas, the overseers of a national disaster to being our liberators from supposed restrictions and our memories are wiped of everything that went wrong. John, that is such an interesting point. This idea that if we continue to wear masks and social distance, it's a constant visual reminder of this government's appallingly shambolic vaccine program aside attitude and policy on COVID. I hadn't even thought of that. Thanks so much for your text, John. Anthony has called from Staines. What would you like to say? Oh, hi there. Yes. Uh, what about Boris Johnson as ever? I'm taking what he says with a very large pinch of uh, NACL, otherwise known as table salt. Mm. <laughs> yes. He's playing to two galleries. One is the science and one is his backbenchers. Okay. In what way? So the backbenchers, you're talking yes. about lockdown skeptic people who do tend to populate the backbench of the Tory party. Yes, exactly. And Tasha, think about someone like Andrew Bridgen, who's mm. been doing the rounds, you know. And Boris now knows he's no longer immortal. He's no, no longer, uh, uh, you know, unassailable after the, two, the last two by-elections and after the Hancock disaster. Uh, mm. So he's got to keep them sweet. But he doesn't want to go the same way as Theresa May, does he? So he's cementing his position with, within the party by declaring his intention, even if yes. he can't actually deliver it. Yes, that's it, isn't it? May, the intention... But he's been here before so many times, so he knows very well he's got to almost play it to the uh, to midnight before he uh, has to make the big announcement. Mm. You remember last Halloween? That was a horror when he had to <laughs> announce another lockdown. He's had to do it so many times before. What do you think if the, the Prime Minister is able to make good on his promise and if we mm. do move to a stage where it's one rule for the vaccinated, another rule for the unvaccinated, <laughs> what would that look like? What do you think might happen after the 19th of July? Well, I think another farce, I'm thinking about Matt Hancock again, because what comes to mind is just that's another farce. Looking at those figures today, there is, you know, they really are getting really worrying. Mm -hmm. And if we are so well vaccinated, why are those figures so high in this country? And why are people like Andrew Marr getting it despite being vaccinated? I don't trust the vaccine entirely. I'm sorry. Well, so Andrew Marr had to miss one episode of his show, presumably because yes. he was isolating. So he wasn't hospitalised or anything like that. And what no. the vaccination does is it stops you from getting it severely. It doesn't necessarily stop you from contracting the illness. Mm. So I, I, I trust what, the, what we're being told about the vaccination, that it has a 96% success rate in stopping hospitalisation and severe symptoms. What really worries me is long COVID because yes. that's so unknown. That's still being understood by the scientists. And there's, I don't think, any evidence to suggest that the, the vaccination protects against that. The other problem is, Natasha, what's coming on in the autumn? Because, you know, we saw last year that pattern. We could be being hoodwinked simply by the weather. Mm. which we saw a like, huge decline in, in, in infections and in illness last summer. But then come that cool autumn, well, we, we know what happens. And that's a danger. I think we can't rely wholly on one string on the violin. We could have several, including the masks, for at least until the autumn. 
Mm. Well, Chris Whitty agrees with you on that. He mm. thinks that, that masks might have to be a part of our life for the foreseeable future. And of course, when you go to the Far East, because they experience SARS, that is what life is like. It's just been embedded into the culture. And as far as I know, you don't have protests and people talking about their, their liberties and face nappies and, and things of that nature. No. <laughs> Anthony, thank you for your call. Khalid has called from Ealing. What would you like to say? Hi, Natasha. Nice to, uh, of you to take my call. And I believe it's the uh, first time I'm speaking to you. I'm, I'm, I'm an old listener. Oh, you're since very welcome. 19, since 1975, I've been listening to LBC. Let's put it that way. Okay. I'm a bit confused now. I was listening to the previous uh, a caller. Mm. Um, there's a lot of compla uh, complacency from the government. There's no transparency. Mm. Eh? Honestly, one has to be... Why can't they put their hearts on the table and tell the people what's going on? Why two, two sides? Right? I've been vaccinated in, in February. Yeah. Both jabs. Yeah. Mm. But however, having said that, I still take my precautions. Although I'm vaccinated, I still wear the mask and do all the uh, uh, the the things. The three mm. mentioned by uh, by Chris Whitty and and, and uh, the rest, okay. But it has to loosen up a bit for people who have been double jabbed. Yeah, open up for them. Let okay, but how, how how will you enforce that? Because how do we know the difference between somebody who's been double jabbed, somebody who's been single jabbed, and somebody who hasn't been jabbed at all? It's Easy. It's, the, the answer is easy. For, I, I'll speak about myself. I've got an NHS app. All my medical history is there. And it's mentioned there. Well, that's the hugely so, unpopular vaccine passport idea, which has caused ructions wi within the party. Yeah, Natasha, a passport paper... Anybody can falsify that. No, no, it would it would be on an app. It would it would be in digital oh, no, no, form. Yes, okay, but then people good. argue that that would lead to a, a two tier society. No, 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 no. I don't believe that. That's that's nonsense. Honestly, that is nonsense. So you have to prove. And the reason I'm calling, yeah, mm. I've been double jabbed, and uh, what uh, the government said two weeks ago that uh, people who come back. If they go abroad, they come back. They have to have a PCR test on arrival. Yeah. They have to quarantine for 10 days um, and so forth. Mm. And after that, they change their tune, which only last week. Then people who have been jabbed twice, they don't have to quarantine. They don't have to have a PCR test. So long as they can prove they've had the PCR, the, uh, the jabs, mm. two vaccines, mm. they can go back to the normal work. Rao, the crucial question is, please put my mind at rest. Please. And so everybody can, can listen. I went ahead and booked a flight. Yep. I'm going out on the 4th of August. Okay. And coming back on 29th of August. Mm. As I just mentioned, I can prove I've been double jabbed. Yep. Uh, the travel agent said, oh, you have to, to have a PCR test before you fly at the cost of £220. I said, you what? Right. Then when I come back as well, another test, then I think five or eight days after uh, I have to quarantine, then another test at the cost of... So yeah, and I'm afraid, Khaled, that I'm not in a position to be able to reassure you because, as you say, there is really no clarity and no transparency. Transparency. What we're hearing is coming via the tabloid media. We're not hearing a clear statement on what will happen. And in a way, you can understand that because the data may change by the 19th of July. But in another way, for people like you who have made plans for August, I can, I can completely understand it must be incredibly frustrating. Thank you, Khaled, for your call. Rob from Portsmouth has called. What would you like to say? Oh, hi. Um, well, actually, uh, well, um, it's fairly specific, but following up from that last conversation, you said that, that sort of the track and trace, you know, may be leading to a, a two-tier society. Mm. And I think, it, I think it definitely is. And, and the original reason to call you was, I know someone who worked in education, and when uh, they walk down the high street, they will um, get their... Uh, phone and uh, literally tab as many 
um, institu- or you know any restaurants, um, pubs, uh, supermarkets that they can, hoping that they will get a ping so that they get two weeks off work on full pay. Because so, they, they hate their job. And, I mean, they're probably well, not... Well, 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 no, well, well, no, not necessarily hate their job, mm. but um, if, if you're paid by the government and you, you work in education or you're a teacher um, or a medic, um, you can go off um, on two weeks um, on full pay. If you're a plumber or an electrician... You can't. So you've got the ones that are hiding from it because they won't get paid, and you've got the ones that will get paid, and they're they're literally trying as hard as they can to get a ping. So we're Mm. already in a two-tier situation now because we've got the government-paid employees who want to be off work, or, or it's fine if they do go off work, and then you've got the ones who pay for them that um, can't go off work because they won't get paid. That's a really good point, Rob, and I had genuinely never considered that. I mean, I'm sure that this person that you know that is a, a teacher isn't representative, and there may be other reasons why they're doing that fear, for example, of going into a school where we know that the, the, the virus is spreading like wildfire amongst young people, and fear of going into that environment that's not necessarily safe might be a motivator. But and I, this idea that there are those that can afford to isolate and those that can't can't is something that really concerns me and I thank you for drawing it to our attention. Responding to the news that the Prime Minister has said those who are double jabbed may not have to self-isolate or quarantine and my questions to you are what do you think is the motivation behind that announcement by proxy almost, an announcement that was drip fed to us through the tabloid press as opposed to given in a formal speech in the House of Commons? And what do you think will happen if that comes to pass? If come July the the 19th, those who are double jabbed enjoy freedoms which other people are not able to enjoy. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. Lindsay has tweeted at LBC and said, Johnson is wedded to the 19th of July to open up to A, avoid a popularity hit and B, not compromise the rollback of furlough. It's fingers crossed and to hell with the health of children. And Sue from West Sussex has text on 84850 and said, Hi Natasha, I wonder why the concept of civic duty is so less important in this country compared to others. I care and wish to protect others as much as I do for me and mine. Furthermore, what about those who cannot understand, judge or act upon notions of personal responsibility? I speak as a parent of a young adult with additional needs who simply cannot make these decisions decisions. Really important points there, Sue, and I have absolutely nothing to add to them. I think that's really important food for thought. Now, though, I want to slightly change the subject because you will have seen the images coming out of the US over the past week of this life-threatening heat wave, which President Biden has said in no uncertain terms is caused by climate change. And that means that once again, climate change is, is firmly on the agenda. Whether or not it will remain there remains to be seen. But we're joined now by Alice Bell, who is a climate campaigner and writer based in London. Her new book, Our Biggest Experiment, A History of the Climate Crisis, is coming out next week. Alice, welcome to the programme. I I wonder, how long have governments known that climate change is an urgent issue? Uh, Well, they were briefed, well, Congress in America was briefed on it in the mid-50s by scientist Roger Revelle. Um, We'd had sort of scientific discussions before that, so you'd expect the scientific advisors of governments to kind of have their eye on it. But yeah, the first sort of formal briefing was the 1950s. You said urgent, though, and I think that kind of level of urgency and concern kind of grew over time, over the the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Certainly by the 1980s, you had Margaret Thatcher actually was one of the world leaders in, in calling for for greater urgency in terms of global policy. She apparently, she, her scientific advisor told her when she became prime minister, she should be worrying about climate change. And she apparently laughed it off and went, well, I should worry about the weather. <laughs> uh, but he convinced her um, mm. that this was really a concern. So, you know, I mean, it's been, it's at least been the lifetime of a lot of your listeners. It's been since the 80s uh, and arguably a bit before that. 
And I wonder, I, I saw something on social media recently that, that was verified, it, it came from a scientist that said that in as little as 30 years we could have reached the point of no return where there is no way to really save and sustain the planet and I thought that should be on the front page of every newspaper and yet it wasn't so I wonder in the face of all of this evidence why don't we take climate change more seriously? Um, well, I think a lot of us do take it quite seriously. I mean, one of the things that's been really noticeable the last, you know, since lockdown is that on the, before COVID, you can see more and more of an interest and a concern about climate change building and building as it's been building since the 80s. You know, I've, I've lived with this concern my entire life and I'm getting on a bit, uh, like probably a lot of your listeners. Um, and, but there was a real sort of wave of concern the last few years. And I was thinking, you know, COVID came along people are going to have other concerns. But if you look at the polling data, that actually concern about climate change has not only continued all the way through lockdown, but actually increased. Mm. And so I think people, we don't necessarily get the media attention, like you said, why is it not on the front page of every, of every newspaper? Is There are some maybe we could, we could ask for a bit more media attention. It's really great that you know, programs like yours are inviting people like me on. But, uh, and I think this is happening more and more. We have had quite a lot of coverage about the heat wave in the last, the last week, certainly America and, and Canada. And the other thing that's really noticeable about that is both Biden and Trudeau in, in America and Canada, not just talking about the heat wave, but specifically mentioning climate change. Um, and that's, that's very different from, you know, 10 years ago. I think that's a really important point, actually, that because of lockdown, people have effectively paused their lives. They may be less busy than they were before, certainly less distracted. And things like racial justice and climate change have kind of come to the surface during that time because people have been able to give more attention and energy to really important issues, but that it's very easy to ignore, I guess, on a, on a day-to-day basis. I mean, speaking of, of the deadly heat wave in the US and Canada, President Biden and, as you mentioned, Trudeau have been very clear that the climate change is to blame. What action do you think they will take now or should they take now? Well, both of them are, are politicians with a lot of questions um, being asked of them in terms of continuing to, uh, you know, encourage and, and allow uh, fossil fuels to 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 be dug up and, and extracted in, in in both America and in in Canada. I mean, that's an issue for us that's very much live in the UK as well. You know, if our politicians like in the UK, like we've not had a real, we've got some climate skeptics, but most British politicians have for decades said that they want to take action on climate change. And yet they have still continued to invest in a lot of fossil fuels. Um, and this is particularly true of America and Canada. They're both very much countries where there is a lot of fossil fuel extraction and a lot of money made from fossil fuels. Uh, and they need to start thinking about that. I mean, there's another big story in climate change this week has been an investigation by Greenpeace, which shows um, an Exxon uh, lobbyist kind of admitting um, that they've been playing quite a few games really and not really playing fair um, and it's been striking that in the last day or so I think we've seen that that there's going to be questions in American um, in Congress being asked of of many fossil fuel majors and that could it could be that that sting that sort of scandal coming from Greenpeace at the same time as this heat wave could come together to have a little bit more scrutiny from politicians of the fossil fuel industry in the states and I mean the optimist in me likes to think that this might be a bit of a turning point. Alice Bell, climate change campaigner and writer based in London. Her new book, Our Biggest Experiment, A History of the Climate Crisis, is coming out next week. But now I want to return to our conversation about the Prime Minister saying that those who are dab double jabbed may not have to self-isolate or quarantine. And what do you think is going on there? We've had an anonymous text on 84850 that says the UK government removing quarantine requirements for people with two vaccines despite soaring cases is not unique. In Scotland, the First Minister is still still planning to reduce restrictions on the 19th of July and remove them entirely in early August, despite Scotland having the highest COVID rate in Europe. Perhaps the political pressure is being felt on both sides. Really interesting point there. And Maria has called from Twickenham. What would you like to say? Yes, I, as I said to your researcher, I'm sick and tired. Everybody's blaming the Prime Minister. This is an invisible enemy. We have to look after ourselves. So therefore, others will be all right. Well, I think, I think the problem is, though, that we can, people like you and me might take personal responsibility, but because, as you say, it's an invisible enemy and it's so highly transmissible, our health is to an extent in the hands of other people. And therefore, we do need, need clear guidance on what it's safe and not safe to do. But he gave us clear guidance every single night when we had the 
pandemic. Now, because he's releasing a little bit of liberty on the 15th or the 19th of July, doesn't mean that one doesn't wear masks. We must still wear the mask. I was in hospital recently, and the patient opposite me, she never had the jabs because she says it will alter her DNA. I mean, what can you say to that woman? Well, not a lot, but I wonder, it's not just about people's individual choices, is it? We've, we've had the, one of the highest death tolls in the entire world, and that per, per head of the population, and that is because our government didn't close the borders quickly enough, didn't lock yeah. down quickly yeah. enough. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I wonder there. what, what would you. inspire you to call and defend Boris Johnson in light of that appalling record? I mean, the, the man had the, the virus himself, so he knows what, what people are going through. I um, well, okay. Thank you, Maria from Twickenham, for that. I mean, I don't think that he does. I think there was a period in time where he seemed to have maybe been given an, an empathy transplant whilst he was in hospital recovering from COVID, but that seems to have gone. And in its place is pandering to his backbenchers, putting his political ambitions and his popularity ahead of scientific advice and the health of the nation. And who knows what will happen? But thank you so much for all your thoughts. Now I hope the compassion is gone So that you dream to the world Stay dead, stay dead, stay dead You're dead and out of this world